One of my colleagues who's new to crypto says that he remembers when the internet was new. And at that time, everyone was saying in the media that the internet was just useful for drugs and criminals. Does that sound familiar? Thanks. I, I like this section over here. <laughs> so right now, everyone uses the internet without thinking. Nobody's thinking, oh, the internet, am I a criminal because I'm using Google? So that's what we're going to see in the future. My colleague doesn't want to miss it, so that's why he's new to crypto. That's why he's jumping in now. Someday, he believes crypto will be on everybody's laptops, what everybody's doing. So obviously, this is a little bit threatening to the existing order, right? Um, control of money is basically just control. So the people who have control now, governments, institutions, they're going to want to shut it down. The problem is that it's hard to shut down a movement. You can shut down a person, but you can't shut down a movement. There's just too many voices to silence. So the next best thing, if you can't shut it down, is to become part of it, right? If you can't beat them, join them. And that's why companies now are like ships. The governments and institutions, if they're smart, they're trying to become the rudder on that ship to influence the direction. But a well-built company, it matters how we build our ships because a well-built company is like a ship. It uses the best breakthroughs, the latest breakthroughs in technology, in, in people technology, and it can sense the weather, the currents, and the direction of the wind. So is that what we have now in crypto? I don't think so. I think what we have is a collection of rafts. We've tied them loosely together sometimes, and we're trying to cross a very big body of water in this small little raft. So crypto was started by the rebels, by the visionaries, the counterculture geniuses, which is great. We needed that. And it's been taken forward by traders and gamblers. We needed that, too. We needed some adoption. But how much interest does any of these people have in shipbuilding? I would say not very much. So you may be an early adopter of crypto. You may not care about process at all. But how do you feel about fairness? Can you remember the last time you did not get invited to a lunch that all your friends were going to? How about a time when you had an idea and someone stole it and didn't give you credit for it? We care as humans about fairness. Fairness is kind of built into us. They've done experiments on babies, and actually babies understand the concept of fairness, even before they can talk. So how do we, how do we get more fairness in life? Is life fair? No. I used to tell my kids, they'd say, that's not fair. And I would say, honey, fair is where you buy a pig. It's not the world. So we can make it a little bit better, especially with blockchain. What is blockchain all about? It's about creating equality in the world. So the very basis and foundation of our industry is fairness. So here's what I'm going to tell you that you may not know. The way to build a fair working environment is to build good processes. The more fair a company feels, the happier your teams will be. And the more they can focus on building the world of the future instead of petty squabbles. But fair doesn't happen on its own. The way to build a fair company is knowing how to structure teams, knowing how to manage and incentivize people, and creating processes that allow people to be recognized for what they do. So early last year, I took a job as COO of a crypto company founded by an Asian entrepreneur. He was good. He said all the right things to get me on board. He told me he wanted to build a company that had good processes, that had systems, incentives, um, one that was compliant and legally solid. Turned out he was completely lying. 
What he actually wanted was to cow his American employees into doing questionably shady things, maybe illegal, by tricking them and setting impossible tasks for them and deadlines, and then ridiculing them when they couldn't meet them. Every Monday, it, you won't believe me, but this is true. Every Monday, he would bring all 30 of us into a room for five hours, and he would pick one person to praise, and he'd pick one person to demolish. And he'd spend the next hour just verbally criticizing that person, tearing them apart. And um, about halfway through the meeting, he would order food for himself, and he would eat it in front of us all, and we all were getting hungry, and we knew that we wouldn't be able to eat for another three hours or so. Uh, this is real. Like, this actually happened. And it's a tactic that I've learned in the 48 Laws of Power people use in order to create more of a, a sense of power. But that's not what you want for a company. That's not, you want people to feel empowered themselves. You don't want them to look up to you and think, wow, you're so powerful. So I, I watched my team lose confidence, get disengaged. Um, the entire executive team left, and then the manager started leaving. By the end of a year, this guy had wasted all of his resources, his time, his effort, his money, and he wasn't very far ahead. So lack of fairness will destroy a company's productivity. Yesterday at breakfast, someone asked, at a breakfast talk, someone asked Vitalik about minimum stake size. He said, oh, that's a good question. And he said, I've written an article about that topic. Then he rattled off, I have to read it, just look up parametrizing Casper, the decentralization finality time overhead trade-off. <laughs> I think he was surprised when all of us laughed. But we laugh because for Vitalik, such topics are every day and part of normal conversation. <clears throat> and we knew that for most of us, they're not. So the brilliance of our founders is a point of pride in the ETH community. But companies don't just naturally evolve into effective entities. They need to be shaped by people who understand how to do that. When I joined BitMEX in 2017, I'd been at PayPal and Apple for more time than anywhere else. And so I jumped out of this big tech structured environment and into what seemed like to me the Wild West. At that time, BitMEX was very small. The culture was a trading culture, which essentially meant every man for himself. And I really do mean man here, because I was one of two females at the company and the only one in senior leadership. So that was a wild ride. We were building as fast as possible to meet the demand and capture the market, while also setting up internal processes and structures and infrastructure. Our daily trading volume started at 100K, and by January 2018, it was up to 6 billion a day. It was not an easy time, but it was a very instruction, in, informational time. I learned a lot of very difficult lessons during that time, which I'm, I'm grateful for, and I want to share some of them with you. So I have tips for you. I want you to take these tips back to your team, your teams and make your companies stronger. And I'll tell you why at the end, why this is worth doing. So my first tip is bring women into your leadership. When an organization increases gender balance, they see almost instant improvements in revenue. And they have fewer crisis alerts, they have better decision making, um, team alignments, and over time, better company culture. An MIT study in 2014 concluded that companies with an even gender split will in could increase revenue by roughly 41%. That's pretty startling. Okay, my next, next tip for you is hire experience. You really have two options as a young founder. One is to spend a year going to work for a successful company and learning everything that they do, taking notes, observing, figuring out what works, what doesn't work, and then coming back to your own company. 
And I'm sure all of us have an extra year to take off from our companies and go spend, you know, learning all that stuff, right? Probably not. So the other option is if you feel a sense of urgency to get your tech out there and to beat the competition, you have to iterate and make it the best you can be, but you probably need to hire someone who already knows how to do the things that make your company successful. You can hire passionate, inexperienced people. It's possible for almost nothing, but your company is going to grow more slowly, and it's not going to be ahead of the competition unless you've got a long runway. So that's tip number two, hire experience. Tip number three, this is a hard one, accept the reality that you are not your customer. If I could give you one thing to remember today, it would be that. I know that most of us here are early adopters and we're here because we want to build something that works for us. We want to build something that we need and that's a great place to start. But it's not enough. If you stop there, you're going to fail. You need to ask your customers what they want and then you need to implement it. So um, there's, a, there's an analogy here. Do people really need a quarter inch drill? No, they don't. What they need is a quarter inch hole. And a drill is a good way to do that. But it's not the only way necessarily. So ask your customers what it is they need and then build to that. That's tip number three. Tip number four, create practical solutions and think small. When electricity was invented, it was a technology without an application. There were no lights, there were no fridges, no stoves, no hair dryers, which would be a problem for me. <laughs> and yet, electricity was a great invention. So we have this amazing blockchain technology, but we don't have a lot of real world applications yet. That's where we are. And wherever I go, I'm hearing people talk about how everything's going to change the world, how it's this huge transformational thing. I think we need to start small. We've created this technology. Now we need to start building solutions instead of overarching, world-changing things. Start by, changing, by solving one problem at a time. That's tip number four. Tip number five, if you have to make a change, don't wait too long. I've been in an organization where a founder had a college buddy, college roommate, who was well beyond his background and skills, and he was wreaking havoc throughout the company. So you, as a founder, need to recognize that your company is more important than your buddy. Most of us spend a lot of waking hours in a work environment, and those environments are constantly changing, especially in our industry. It's change is pretty exhausting. So, and change that is imposed on us is even more exhausting. It's difficult to deal with, and people tend to resist it. So, um, how can we make it better? A situation is clearly, if a situation is clearly not working, and it's getting worse, we can avoid it, we can ignore it, or we can deal with it quickly. If we deal with it quickly, we're handling it, we're ahead of it. We're not dealing with it in crisis mode. And crisis mode is pretty exhausting for people as well. So as leaders, let's remember change doesn't have to be negative. You know when you talk to somebody about something they're changing in their lives and they're really excited about it? There's a positivity, there's an optimism there. They are excited about the change they're making. When you talk about change in companies, people get scared, people get worried and fearful. That doesn't need to be the way it is. We could, we could make change in our companies more positive if we just emphasize the benefit from it and do it quickly and decisively. So think carefully about the changes you need to make, but don't put them off. Be brave and be bold. And remember that you are building the future, and that takes courage. That's tip number five. Tip number six, leverage your sense of purpose. Everyone in this industry has something that tech companies would kill to have. 
an underlying foundational sense of what we're building that will change the world. So we all have this innate sense of purpose. That is a huge asset. It's not enough. We have to build around that. But most companies, big companies, they have a financial objective. It's not inspiring to people. People are collecting a paycheck, and that's about it. What we have the opportunity to do is build companies where people are passionate about making changes in the world, and all we need to do is build the structure so that they can be effective in doing that. So that's my six tips. But what happens next? I think we're going to see a lot more mainstream adoption. We're going to see mainstream people coming, players coming into this space. And when that happens, we're no longer, we don't have the edge anymore. We're going to have to move fast and be, it's critical that we are the ones who are building the companies that will take us forward into the future. We want to take our passion and our purpose and build fair, effective, and strong companies with competent leadership. We owe it to the inventors, the founders, and the visionaries who started this movement to build that. And if we don't, what will happen? Facebook. Facebook will build Libra and dominate crypto payments. JP Morgan, Fidelity, will start crypto trading, and they'll dominate that space. Giant tech companies will use their infrastructure, their influence, and their competitive engines to take over the crypto industry and make it just like every other big business. And we will be remembered as the AOL of blockchain. We'll be the early, early pioneers who failed to maintain their relevance in a changing world. I just joined Shapeshift a few weeks ago as COO, and I can say with confidence that Shapeshift is one of the companies that in this space that is putting all the pieces together in a way that makes a solid and scalable entity. The executive team we have is half women and half men, and there are experienced people throughout the organization. The company is able to adapt quickly to changing conditions and listen to customer needs. So I hope you can take some of this back to your teams and make your company stronger. Because in the next phase of our industry, we're going to require strong, safe companies to take the lead and bring electric light to the financial world. Thank you.